Now today really has been a kind of reflective day compared to yesterday. Yesterday we were quite scientific, we were evidence-based. And today we've had a lot more thought about the broader picture of prostate cancer and how we may actually see people and treat them in the wider community. And we decided that we would finish this meeting with our final speaker, Denton Wilson, who is actually a community champion. And in a sense, this brings the day full circle. We st started off hearing about prostate cancer in Afro-Caribbean. Here we have Denton, who's going to finish the day, and I'm sure send you home with very good messages. So, Denton, you've got a microphone. Use Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Denton Wilson, um, before I go into prostate cancer, I'll just give you a brief history. Um, uh, I was born in Jamaica, I left Jamaica when I was nine years old, um, came to England, um, spent most of my, my time here in England, um, and uh, the problem was I had a father that was left behind, I didn't know my father, and it took me 42 years find my father, 42 years, and eventually when I found my father, my father was dying of prostate cancer. I didn't even know what prostate cancer was. And for the two weeks I was in Jamaica, he hid the fact through, there's a lot of African Caribbean men hide the fact that they have something down there. They talk about what the exposure, sexual exposure is and what they can do with what I think. But when something goes wrong, they do not want to talk about it. And my father was one of those, those men. And he was in denial. But after I met him when, when I was 42, he then started to open himself up because he was, he was, because he was looking for me and I was looking for him. And um, uh, he then started to fill, fill the pieces in. And um, uh, he then came out that he had prostate cancer. And within two weeks, my father died. I watched my father die. And I went, came back to England because I had to. And then I got someone who went back over me. And then I had the painful thing to bury my father. And I thought, then I have to do something about it. But there must be a reason why I met this man. Because there's got to be something around it. So I went, when I came back to England, I went, I got myself checked. I asked the doctor, can you check and see if I've got prostate cancer? And he go, there's nothing wrong with you. You look healthy, fine. I said, I wanted to have a test. And it took a while. And eventually, when I explained to him about my father, I was given the opportunity to go for a test. I was scared. I was frightened. And I went and I had the test. And when my surgeon, my doctor, my surgeon, sat down, asked me to sit down, and he told me, I was fine, I was nervous, because I think, see my father died, and the pain he suffered, I didn't want to go through that. But when my doctor explained, just on my surgeon, and they explained to me the process and, the, and what I had to do, I, I welcomed that, because there was no lies, it tell it as it is, because I felt that was important to me. I wanted to know what I have to go through. My life, right, I was very sexually active, you know, and I was, I was very uh, into sports and everything like that. And I knew from what was told me, told to me, everything was going to change. And he goes, this is what you have to do. Uh, what I didn't do, if I, he said, if you wanted family, get your, you put the sperm, saved, and frozen, which I did. So I actually was actually preparing myself for something I know was going to happen. And I think the insight of seeing my father, because this image of my father in pain motivated me that I had to do something. I didn't want to not do nothing because meeting my father, he gave me life and I wanted to do something about it. So I actually went through all the procedures and all that. And I was nervous, but I knew it had to be done. And I went through the process of, um, uh, before I actually did that, I had my, my, my vicar, my mom, my girlfriend, and we, we sang praises of him, we 
prayed, because I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, everything was left up to God. And I prayed and said, God, give me the strength to overcome this, because if I overcome this, I will show you what I can do. And he gave me the opportunity. That's why I'm here now. I'm 55 years old, and I'm moving forward. Now, the thing is, going through, I can relate to this gentleman, what he's going through about the capital, I have a capital. It was, it was an embarrassment. But because it was explained to me what I had to go through, I was prepared. I was prepared. Emotionally, there was a lot of things because I had a wonderful girlfriend and I chose to push her to one side. That was the hard thing that I had to do. I made it difficult. She wanted to be with me, but I did not want it because I could not perform. I could not perform. And I felt less than a man and I felt that I was betraying her because, and she wanted so to be with me no matter what. But because of, like I said, now that I know, I would never, I would never have done that. That's why I talk to men about these things. In hindsight, I wouldn't have done that. But I chose that I did not want to run. I wanted to be isolated. I wanted to, to be on my own, you know? And I, and I chose that, you know? And, 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 and I took center out of my life, and I lived in isolation. And I thought about it, and I'm thinking, this is not right. My dad in my head said, this is not right. What, what are you doing? And every time I see my surgeon, he always asks me, how's things? I'm sorted, I'm improving, I'm improving, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. I followed because of what the foundation that was laid out to me, I followed that, that procedure and it made me strong. And then I thought, there was a lot of black people who were dying. And when I actually went to their funeral, what they were dying of? Cancer. And I didn't really still understand. And I think over the years of talking to my, my surgeon, and he, motiv he carried on motivating me because he gave me that kind of inner strength because I wanted to, to make sure I said, yes, everything is fine. And I decided to wake myself up. And I decided, well, what can I do? So I got involved with them uh, doing fitness, exercise, because you know, that's what I used to do. And I, and I decided to get involved in bodybuilding. I got involved in bodybuilding and my strength came. I, I, I followed the public for exercise and I was doing, I was doing great. So every time I saw my surgeon boy, doing this, it was brilliant. And things was getting better. And I kept on improving, kept on improving, kept on improving. And I, to the fact that I, I become, became number one in Britain for natural bodybuilder. For two years running, I was number one. And I came fourth in the world. I didn't tell no one that I had prostate cancer because I did not want that. Because what, what I looked at, when I looked at celebrities who had problems, any kind of disease, it's all about it. And everyone stops and thinks, oh, they've got this. But I was, a, I was just an ordinary person who had this problem. But no, I was a silent voice. So I thought, how can I best reach people to be a celebrity? Do something. So I actually pushed myself forward. I went on to um, Britain's Got Talent. <laughs> right? One of the, Britain's Got Talent. You Google Denton Wilson and look at YouTube and you'll see me all in one. Britain's Got Talent. Right? And I never told anyone, never told anyone that I had prostate cancer because I did not want to actually at that point. I want people to know who was Denton Wilson. And once they actually then knew who Denton Wilson was, I then hit them with it. And they were shocked. People now comes up to me and wanted to talk about prostate cancer. I've got so many people in, 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 in discussion around certain issues about prostate cancer. And, uh, and some of them now have, have passed on because they left it too late. But for those that I've, I've helped, I see them regularly, shake hands, and they say respect. Now, 
through Mr. Mr. Anderson here, he's the one that operated on me. This man. This was not right. right? This is the man. This is the man that motivated me. So I'm thinking. Now when he when he, he then said, Denton, you're doing a great job. He says, Have you ever thought about the, 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 the charity? And I'm thinking, no. He goes, listen, get involved with the charity, which I did. And I've never looked back since. You know what I mean? Because and then I know more. I still, I'm still learning, but I, I know far more about how to deliver any kind of talks regarding prostate cancer. All I basically, I am the catalyst to, in order to empower those, those men to go and get themselves checked. Now, the professional part of it is to dealt with, with those other people. I want to get them into the surgery to get themselves, first of all, checked with a PSA, because I think it's important. Many black men thinking, oh, what are they going to be doing? They stick the fingers on the backside and that's it. And I don't want to know that. You know what I mean? They're very frightening. Now, I've even gone further. I've even gone further because I don't, I don't stop where I am. I move. I went all the way to Jamaica and met the Prime Minister. I'm thinking, yeah. Why not? Because it, it was saying African Caribbean men are three times more likely to have prostate cancer. I'm from Jamaica. My dad died of prostate cancer. I didn't know much about it. I know a little more now. And I want to do something. I want to make a difference. So basically, I went over there and I spoke to the Prime Minister. I spoke to the Minister. And there was, they were flabbergasted. They were we need you here. <laughs> we need you here. I mean, there was, there, was a, there was a point where I went to a church and there was a, there was, because men don't really like to talk about issues like that. And um, when I went to a church, I was specifically talking about prostate cancer. And I, and I spoke to the pastor and he says, yes, you can have the chair. And I stood there and I said, I've got prostate cancer. And, and I told them all the things. And they were, they were like shocked. But there was one man in the congregation stood up. And he's been in the congregation for many, many years. And he says, I've got prostate cancer. But I did not want to reveal it. But it took you to open my eyes because I know that there's life after prostate cancer because of what you've actually achieved. And that's basically, it has motivated me even more. And they wanted me to come back. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be bombarding the, the, the charity now. <laughs> uh, if, if they're talking about doing the work and, and, and making it bigger, I want to be that link to actually continue that, that, that particular work. My, my kind of, um, regarding um, my the sexual part of my life. <laughs> Seriously. And I think the, the fact is, is because of, of, of my diet, the way that I train, I look after my body, I eat the right food, right? I wear my girlfriend out. <laughs> I have so much energy that I don't know where it's come from. Right? So there is life at the prostate cancer. You know what I mean? So I'm quite, I'm quite happy in, where, in where, I, where I am. I just feel sorry for those people who are still in isolation. And those people who are in isolation, those are the kind of people we need to get to. Right? And I don't mind being a person that will talk to those individuals because I think it's important. They have somebody like myself. Right? Who can actually be able to, to, uh, to relate. I don't want to talk to black people or talk to white people because most of the people that I've helped has been white people. The majority of the people, what I'd like to help is, is to go to Jamaica and, and the other islands and try to empower them to understand that it's needed because they've got all different ideas how they can say they can stop prostate cancer. And some of their ideas are ridiculous. <laughs> Seriously, someone says that eating tomatoes alone is going to stop them from having prostate cancer. You know, I don't know if it's true, but I'm saying you can't carry on that way. What you need to do, first and foremost, go and get yourself checked. That's the first thing. Don't be frightened. Go and get yourself checked. A simple blood test or a urine test, and that's all. Now, if then it was investigated that something else needs to be done, then you would then look at the options that's available. And I thank you, Mr. Anderson, for 
pushing me in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The man who's gone way beyond what he ever needed to. And of course the question arises, can you motivate other people to be as motivated oh, as I you? Can. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. I met Mr. Motivator in Jamaica. <laughs> and he wants me to come back. <laughs> Questions for Denton. Yes. Can I just say, Denton, you are the quintessential masculine. <laughs> but also some partners, women and men. Um, and they are volunteers, they are selected and trained to either do awareness work and or um, peer support work, which is what Peter alluded to, which is this matching, where we can match clients via our helpline to men who've been through similar situations. So people simply need to call our helpline, actually, and say, I'd like to train as a volunteer. Thank you, Sarah. Any other questions for Denton? Denton, thank you very much. Thank it's you. great to see you.